Good evening. This is Chairwoman Julie Hen. I call to order the joint meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County and the Area Education Advisory Councils for Tuesday, April 27th, 2022. At this time, I would like to turn the meeting over to Ms. Donna Sibley, the coordinator for the Area Education Advisory Councils. Thank you, Julie. I want to thank everyone for being here, and I know the traffic was horrible tonight, mm -hmm. and everyone that wanted in-person meetings, maybe they're double thinking this, and maybe the Zoom might have been better. <laughs> I see some heads nodding out there. Um, before we start, there's some housekeeping that I want to go over. This is an open meeting, so it is being recorded. So when everyone speaks, you will need a microphone. So please raise your hand because we only have, I think, two portable mics. So someone will have to bring you the mic uh, to speak and speak clearly. Please be very patient with each other. Uh, we're here to do good, not to argue and not to be upset with each other. And I ask you also, we do have limited time. So those that have more members, have to share their time a little bit more than those that only have one. So I thank you very much. And now we will go for some introductions. And I'm going to turn that back over to Chair Hen. Thank you, Donna. And again, welcome. Um, this is one of my favorite meetings that the board gets to participate in. Um, many of you know I started as an education advocate as the chair of the Northeast Advisory Council. So this is near and dear to my heart and I enjoyed conversations prior to starting this meeting. So um, thank you all for being here tonight and look forward to many more of those conversations in the year to come. At this point, I would like to introduce my fellow board members that are with us, beginning with Vice Chair, Mr. Rod McMillian. We also have Ms. Makita Scott, Ms. Mrs. Kathleen Causey, and Ms. Lisa Mack, and of course, Dr. Dara Williams is with us as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Williams, do you, do you have any staff that or anything you would like to? Okay. So good, good evening, everyone. We do have our chief of schools. Uh, previously, he was the chief of school safety and climate, and we have Dr. Michael Zarchin seated next to mm -hmm. Tracy Gover, who is the board assistant. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Now, I would like to introduce to you the um, advisory councils. We have all the chairs, not all the chairs, almost all the chairs, um, but we do have a representative from everyone. And I'm gonna start with the um, cell, uh, Northwest. Cliff Collins is the chair, and there are two vice chairs. One is um, Aaron Plummeth, and the other is um, Deborah Hannon. Unfortunately, none of them can be here tonight. They're all in very good places doing work, a lot of them with children. So we have a representative, uh, LaShawn Stitt, Dr. LaShawn Stitt, excuse me. She's gonna represent the Northwest for today. Southwest, we have the chair, and the chair is Marlena Collington Purcell. She's right back there, yeah. Uh, and then the Northeast, is the chair is Tiffany Stith, and Tiffany has with her today Anita Bass and Lily Lee. It's good to see Lily. I haven't seen Lily in a while. It's good to see everyone in person. Everyone looks a little different than on the little screen. So I appreciate that. And then we go to the southeast, and the chair is Jackie Brewster, and the vice chair is Sandy Cordalis. And last but certainly not least is Central. And the chair is Dr. Bash Verone. The vice chair is Yuri Chia. And the members here today are Ingrid Wu, Elisa Alfonso, and Maggie Henson. Uh, Manny Henson, excuse me. <laughs> Gave you a new name, Manny. Sorry. OK. Um, before we start again, I want to remind you, just raise your hand. Speak clearly, and please, if someone is speaking, 
please no one else speak because no one's going to be able to understand what's going on in the recording if you do that. Okay. I'm going to start with uh, this Northwest because LaShawn has another engagement, so she's, gonna, she's doing double duty, triple duty tonight. So LaShawn, would you like to sure. bring us up to date on what's happening in the Northwest? Sure. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Good evening. Good, good evening. <laughs> it's good to see everyone in face to face as well. I know we've had a few of these meetings over the years, some familiar faces. Um, I am the sole representative this evening for the Northwest Area Education Advisory Council. And on behalf of Mr. Collins, I would like to share his statement that he wanted me to share and a couple of additional pieces that we want to include. So at our last meeting, we mentioned our overwhelming support and approval of the school system's plans to finally develop a formal career technology educa and education program for the Northwest area. That has been a long time coming. A planning grant for further development of this major initiative has been approved. A virtual meeting of community stakeholders will be held on Thursday, April 28th, tomorrow, <laughs> to begin an initial discussion about Baltimore County Public Schools Northwest Area Career and Technical Public School um, Education Center. Our chair, Mr. Collins, and Mr. Aaron Plymouth, uh, who is the co-vice chair, have been invited to serve on this stakeholder group. Um, and Ms. Sibley, I know you were informed of all of that. Um, uh, we have also held joint meetings with the Southwest Area Education Advisory Council, um, addressing the needs of our side of the corridor uh, and continuously having issues of discipline, transportation, uh, the operating from a pre-COVID perspective in schools, um, and, and a lack of an after-school or recreational program for the Northwest area uh, that is affordable for our students. So that's just an overview of what we've been doing, what our focus is, and um, where we're going. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to move to the Southwest. Marlena Purcell. Hello. We're good? Okay. Good evening once again. My name is Marlena Collinson Purcell for the record. I am the chair of the Southwest um, Education Advisory Council um, in which we <coughs> have the area from um, Arbutus, Lansdowne, Catonsville, Woodlawn, the Windsor Mill area, as well as the um, Gwen Oak. And so we cover that end of the county. Um, it is my pleasure not only to be here, but to represent our particular um, stakeholders. Uh, the state of the Southwest area is good. Um, if I was in church, I would say, give me an amen. But nevertheless, <laughs> we all have to understand that we, had, we all had trying times. Um, and with those trying times, we leaned on each other. That's another amen. And so <laughs> with that being said, we found that um, our monthly meetings um, were best suited online. And we continue to have monthly meetings uh, via Zoom. And um, with the help of Tracy Gover, we were able to get all our flyers out monthly to the schools. And the schools were able to disseminate them to their rec um, respective places. And folk attended. With that being said, we had um, we discovered that um, not only we value our each time, each uh, parent and guardian's time, but we re recognized that it would be um, suitable to combine areas because of the same topic, and we found that got us greater um, community representative and. Likewise, it allowed us to um, hear common trends and also be able to support each other um, and utilize our resources from Baltimore County Public Schools so that they would not be jumping all over the county as well. And I know they appreciated that as well. So with that being said, um, I'm just going to just summarize um, my attendance and representation, um, attending the ribbon cutting of the new schools, uh, Chadwick, and also attended three board meetings to speak um, live. Attended all of the joint um, area education uh, meetings, presided or facilitated monthly meetings, presented 
uh, was present, excuse me, at the stakeholders, um, and I don't know if they still call it that, but it was a reopening stakeholders, and I uh, should say re formally known as. Um, also represented the Southwest area in the equity um, committee. Um, likewise, the, I don't know, we have had so many committees that we joined, but um, likewise, we were heavily involved in the My Pass, as you know. With that being said, each month we found new parents interested in our topics. Um, we were able to gather more emails and more contact numbers so that we can uh, make a distribution list. Um, we're always willing to receive emails to, for comments and questions, as well as, as um, put things on Facebook. Which brings me to our major concern. Our concern is our communication, trying to make sure that um, the topics are of interest and so that people can attend, but making sure that the parents are receiving them or guardians are receiving them. It's one thing to make a flyer, but to get it into the schools is another thing and to make sure that they um, receive it as opposed to me standing out and twisting the sign like the Domino's people. Um, but I just want that that lens. I want. I know many of you share that concern that we need to make sure that our flyers and our topics are getting out there. So um, I want to just thank. You know, oftentimes we have a monthly calendar that goes out for Baltimore County, and I think uh, think that Southwest has benefited from that. Um, benefited from having our website and the. Um, the announcements online so someone can go there and click on that. So I thank for that. Um, I just would like to see once the flyer gets to a principal that maybe perhaps the secretaries get it as well. And they're having that access to give out that um, information because oftentimes we know principals, administrators are busy. Sometimes they're absent, whatever the case may be. But the secretary, and let me give a shout out to, it is Administrative Assistance Day. And um, they do a remarkable job, phenomenal job. And so I'm just wishing that perhaps we, we also give them the privy to get the information out as well. I'm going to just wrap up by saying um, it is my pleasure to serve in this capacity. Um, it is uh, probably about my third year. I'm, I call myself the newbie, and I keep that title. I'll remain keeping that title because I certainly every day learn something new about the Southwest area. Um, I like to speak to our parents and guardians and stakeholders. So please make sure that you email if you can't attend. Um, but let's not wait behind and let something happen. Let's be proactive. And I just wanted to share that with my time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Thank I you. Yeah. I think we're going to go now to the Northeast because I see a mic there and then we can get. Okay. The North. <laughs> Lily, I think there is a mic there. Okay, it's on. You can hear me. And I'm not yelling. So are you okay? Okay, my name is Anita Bass. I'm from the Northeast area. I've been involved with this Northeast area for probably 25 years, I think. <laughs> 20 years, maybe. Probably like, yeah. So um, I've been around for a while. My, course, my kids have already gone through uh, Baltimore County Public Schools and also through Towson University. So I'm here today to speak about, of course, like she said, communication. That's something that we definitely need um, to make sure that parents know about our meetings and about the issues and concerns and anything that, that they want to bring up that's positive too, according to the schools. Also, we have a concern about our buses and overcrowding, and that's been something that has been on my front burner since uh, probably 20 years ago. <laughs> but it's been something that's been important, you know, and I know that it's important to everybody and the parents. And um, we need to make sure we have safety for that. Also, I, I have another, I have a job <laughs> that I work at. I work at the Baltimore County Public Library. We work closely with the schools. And there's some things that we are looking for. Uh, we serve meals at the schools. I mean, we serve meals at the library. We really want to make sure that that communication gets to the schools and to the parents in the community. 
When the summer starts, we're gonna be having uh, summer meals every day. And if that's something that we can work together to make sure that the students know, we have talked about um, making sure that the teachers know at the end of the school year that the library is available for activities, programs, and also for the educational part because we like to help them keep going through the summer, you know, and then we're gonna provide meals for them too. We're also concerned about the lack of internet access because we do have hotspots that we lend out to the community, but we can't keep them, they stay out. And a lot of students are using them for schoolwork and they come in and the parents come in and they're looking for them and they're already out, you know, they're already rented out, you know, sent out. We also have several high school parents that have been asking for service learning hours for their students to do, but because of the pandemic, there's a lot of places that aren't doing them. So is there, if there's some way that we can connect with the school system to help them and to help the students when they do come in, because when it's after school hours, they come to the library and they're asking for resources. They're looking for help and we want to help them. Also, we also have been getting a lot of calls about uh, free tutoring for after school help. I don't know if there's anything that Baltimore County, you know, schools can do to help us for that, but we do have a high amount of students that are asking for that. And parents are looking for that, you know, math, reading, and it's been all, all ages, all, you know, all the way up to high school. And you know what? I just want to say thank you to everyone that's doing a great job and helping our students. I've seen a lot of changes over the years. I've seen a lot of promises that haven't come through and I've seen promises that have come through. So I just want to say thank you from, from me, okay? And I guess I'll turn it over to Tiffany. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. So. Thank you for having the meeting. It's good to see everyone after all these years of, of not being together and not um, seeing each other face to face and on the computer screen, it's nice to be back um, in person. So um, Anita is one of our long-term members. You heard her say how long she's been around and we wanted to give her the opportunity to speak because um, normally with these meetings, it is only like the chairs that can come. So I think it is helpful when you're able to hear directly from the members of our councils and not just um, us as the chairs kind of relaying that information to you. Um, so the main thing I just want to add on, uh, well, let me back up. I'll give a little synopsis of some things we've done in the Northeast area and then um, a specific concern and that's regarding transportation. So across this past school year for the Northeast, what we've done in the midst of the pandemic is we've had hybrid. So um, from month to month, we've gone from one month will be in person and then the following month will be virtual. So we've gone back and forth um, to help address the concerns of community members who want to be in person, but then also for those who may not be as um, certain yet with, with coming out, especially back in the fall. Um, so that's been our format this year. Our topics have included things like transportation, magnet programs, um, and then our January meeting was a brand new topic, but it was relevant because you guys as the board are hybrid board. So some of you are elected, some of you are appointed, and so we do have an election coming up in November 22 of this year. And we wanted to have someone, we had someone from the Maryland State Board of Elections come and speak so that we as the community can understand kind of that process. If anybody was interested, they could, you know, follow that process, but at minimum just understand what does it take for community, you guys were once just, I don't want to say regular community members, but you've gone from being community members to being members of the board. So that was um, a new uh, meeting for us this year. Um, as the chair, like Marlena said, we've been included in so many meetings. Um, it can be a little bit overwhelming, but it's it's good. I think it's helpful um, when you're including all of us from the areas and we're able to speak on reopening. I know Dr. LaShawn said I've heard her multiple times in those meetings giving feedback about how do we get our students back in school safely? How do we address the academic issues that we had you know, prior to the pandemic and then even as a result of the pandemic. Um, and so I appreciate that we're being included in those meetings so our voices are being heard. Um, and so our concern, what I would say specifically from the Northeast, um, 
Anita spoke about it somewhat, but it's transportation. And a couple of things within transportation as far as the number of students um, on the bus, um, but a big thing is just the location of these bus stops. Um, there's been a concern from a lot of different neighborhoods about the bus stops being on the main roads. And we have reached out to transportation. I've had conversations with Dr. Grimm. And um, one of the things we at the Northeast were looking forward to with the proposal that transportation brought to the Board of Education was the location for parents being able to know where their children are. So when these buses are late for a pickup, for drop off, at least a parent could have a better idea of where their child is. Not every child has a cell phone to be able to communicate with their parent. Um, so that was one of the features that we were excited about. Um, a second feature is the video capability that it was supposed to be on um, the buses. So um, as far as if there are behavior issues, disciplinary issues, um, there's video. And then also, um, I think there was supposed to be video on the outside of those buses. So if you have drivers who are speeding past these buses, even though the stop sign is out, mm -hmm. we have video to capture that information as well. Um, you probably heard back in early April about the seven-year-old boy that was struck um, by an elderly driver while waiting for the bus. And so I would hate that that has to be a situation that happens here in Baltimore County for us to get something done about the transportation. Um, we want to be, again, I think as someone said, we want to be proactive more than reactive. And this really is an issue on those busy streets. Um, but some of the communities, I think when the bus stops, is, bus stops were created, the community wasn't finished. But then once the community has been finished being built out, that development is done, I think there does need to be a reassessment of where the um, the bus stops are located. Um, but we thank you guys for all the, the work that you do. We look forward to continuing to work with you as the advisory, and that's everything I have. So thank you. Now we'll go to the southeast. OK. Can everybody hear me? I know I got a mask on, but sorry about that. OK, so we. I'm Jackie Brewster, and this is my um, Usually she's this way, my right right hand, Sandy. <laughs> um, I only take this job if Sandy's gonna um, um, be there with me because we've been doing this for a long time. So in the Southeast, we meet on a regular basis in person for most meetings. And thanks to BCPS for supplying staff members for all of our meetings. We really learn a lot during those meetings. Um, thank you to Ms. Gover for all of her assistance throughout all this time I've been, you know, that she's been working with me. It's been wonderful. So thank you, Ms. Gover. And thank to Rod for coming to almost all of our meetings. You know, it, it helps having a board member there because he gets to hear us right away, don't you, Mr. McMillian? You get to hear right away from us. So, um, so now um, what I did, and I know it's a little bit different, is I went back and, and printed out all of my minutes, because I take minutes, and I turn a minute every meeting, and I went back and I printed out my minutes. And I'm going to tell you some of the questions that we had from our minutes that I don't believe were fully answered. So why not follow the my IPAS uh, recommendations? Why only Towson and Delaney? Why not all of the 21 premium product projects? Um, when, we, um, when will Dundalk High School addition be done? Will you be adding the maritime program there? If Patapsco High School cannot get a new building, when will the additions be completed? Um, will you add space for career and tech programs there? We learned last night that there's no more room for career and tech at, at not last night, Monday night, that there's no room to add career and tech programs because there's no space. Are we fully staffed in the Southeast? Or are we still using substitutes to teach our children? Uh, when, we're, uh, when are we adding career and tech programs back to middle schools? Uh, when will we be removing the fourth and fifth graders from Hollabird, putting them back in Normwood? This too was another My iPass recommendation. And then the high school study was supposed to be about all of the Southeast and when we attended the meeting, they said, it's, it's all about Sparrows Point. That, that was from the presenter. You go back and watch, because Sandy and I just looked at each other and said, what? So um, what is being done to address behavior in our schools? And then the last one, I added this one today, because you learn a little bit every day when you're, when you're um, working in schools, is how are we going to address cell phone usage, uh, cell phones being used during class? So 
Uh, you want to add anything you want to add? Thank you, Adam. Okay, so I'm going to pass it on. Now we'll go to Central. I believe we're starting with the Vice Chair. All right, so so it's the the order is kind of strange here, but I'm I'm gonna start. I'm gonna men, instead of going even a broader overview, I'll leave that over to to my other members. I'm gonna talk about one topic that I feel that the the BCPS would benefit everybody would benefit from, from addressing that. For example, because of the pandemic, of course, discrimination against minorities, in particular against of course Asians, African Americans, have gone up significantly. And so one issue that I've been talking about for a while is the fact that the curriculum needs to be redone. It may not be redone, but edited, changed to incorporate more aspects of, for example, Asian American history, um, African American history into the curriculum. So, for example, when students, when they take like a basic government class or they take a history class, then the, then the teachers would talk about Asian American history, African American history to the students, and most importantly, emphasize the contributions that Asian Americans and African Americans have made to to this society. For example, like during the gold rush, the when you have like the the railroads, the railroads were designed by by the Asian Americans who were immigrated here, and they went through a like they 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 suffered like the worst conditions, and they sacrificed their life to build the railroads that we use on a daily basis. So, for example, emphasize that contribution, and then when when people understand the contributions that all races or minorities make to the society, then everybody will gain an appreciation for each other. And that's going to be the key that, that, will, that will bring about better relations about everybody. And that benefits everybody. It benefits teachers, it benefits students, and it benefits parents. So that's the one big point I wanted to talk about tonight. Thank you, Yuri. So yeah, I just Actually, Yuri was the uh, student representative from Towson High before he became vice chair. So, And I actually was the Towson High rep decades ago during Bob Dubell when he was uh, superintendent. And I'm still in touch with him. So I actually tried to get him to join our central area. He, he wanted to, but his daughter said, being 90-some years old, Dad, I think you've got, you know, you should lay back a little bit. So I'm Ingrid. Um, I, like I said, I've, I've been on the Central Area of Values Council. I mean, this time around for almost a decade, but even as far back as when I was in high school when Dr. Dubell was superintendent. So you can kind of count back how many decades that is. Um, I want to, uh, I guess, mirror what uh, Yuri said about um, expanding the curriculum, because that, that, I think that is very important. I remember in um, world history in high school, there was one paragraph about the Opium War. So I make that point, like how many people know why in 1997 um, the British had to give back Hong Kong to China? I mean, the opium war was what started it. And if you think about it, that opium and drugs is still um, a, a relevant um, issue today. So have we learned from history? Um, the British back then were drug pushers. They used China to push their drugs so they can improve the, the trade balance, basically. And now we still have opium and other drug issues. So if we don't learn from history, then the mistakes that we've made in history will repeat itself. So expanding the curriculum is really important so that it, it, you know the curriculum isn't just Eurocentric. There's nothing wrong with learning European history. Absolutely, we need to, but we need to expand on that and see a balance, um, see how the world, um, it, it, I mean, especially the United States, is a melting pot. We are melting pots, so we need to include everybody, not, not just uh, the mainstream, so to speak. Um, and especially during the pandemic where we've had issues come up, for example, you're mentioning the increase in anti-Asian hate, uh, people have to realize that um, if you don't agree with the government in China, um, doesn't mean that all the people are bad. And especially the students who have come here, um, I I've work with a lot of international students at Hopkins, for instance, and I keep reminding the students as well that you are goodwill ambassadors from your country. So get to, you know, 
be involved in the community and get to know people so that they can see that as people, you are great, you know, you're here to learn and we exchange ideas. And when people understand each other, that's when we can make progress and make the world a peace, more peaceful and better place. It's when we don't understand each other that it causes prejudice and bias and misunderstandings. So I think that's very important. And um, it, as far as for the students that we tap into whatever resources we have, uh, for instance, um, if we can expand on foreign la world languages, um, and study abroad opportunities when the time comes and uh, when you know COVID travel allows, right? So I had mentioned um, in, in Central Area that I have been very involved in URI too with Rotary um, Youth Exchanges. So Rotary actually has programs where they send students abroad for a, a, a school year. Um, and um, it's a great opportunity. I mean, I actually went on a Rotary scholarship for grad school. So it was a great opportunity to study abroad. Yuri has been involved with the Rotary Youth Exchange. And um, if we can tap into that, for example. And another example is last summer, I know two Towson High graduates actually got a scholarship to go to Korea to study. So uh, let us um, make sure that we get the communications out about the resources, even if BCPS you know, we can't do everything at BCPS, but there are resources um, locally, state, or internationally, right? Nationally, internationally. Let's tap into, make sure that we get the information about the national scholarships and opportunities to the students, to the parents, to the families. A lot of students might not know that. Um, there was a question about tutoring. I would say tap into, for instance, Towson University, you know, the College of Education. There are a lot of future teachers. And um, if we can tap into that, they would, I think it would be great experience for them to ask them to help tutor the students, whether it's you know, pre-K pre all the way through high school because they're early childhood majors, there are special education majors, there are uh, math, science. I mean, I've taught a lot of future math and science teachers. So let's beef up, beef up but what we can, you know, tap into the talent that we have. The other area is online. Since, you know, virtual, I highly, 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 I mean, our, our attendance has been up because it's, you know, we've had the virtual, because a lot of people, with Central being so big from, what, the Pennsylvania line down to the city line, from Hartford County to Carroll County, we're huge. So expecting people to come in in person sometimes is very hard. They have to drive 20 miles one way. So virtual is great, and virtual, if we can tap into the talent, wherever, even in the world. And that's part of also expanding the curriculum, expanding the possibilities, letting students see the world so that we can better prepare them in the world so that they become better world citizens to contribute to world society and peace and understanding. I hope that helps. Thank you so much for meeting with us today. Um, I'm new to see to the council, to the Central Area Council, and in fact, I learned about the council only when I was invited to join. So, um, and Ingrid invited me to join. So, thank you so much. I'm a mother of four. My youngest is two, and then I have three kids attending the elementary school and middle school. Um, I am. I joined because I wanted to learn about how the education system works, how BCPS operates, and how to affect change in the school system. And I want to share, first of all, that I've been so impressed with the teachers um, that my kids have had. The, my kids have had amazing teachers and counselors. So many of them are so dedicated and so innovative, innovative in how they teach. Um, and I really, I really think it's amazing that BCPS has such great teachers. Uh, unfortunately, I've been a little less happy with the way the school system operates and with the administration. Um, and I think that there's ways to make changes that are essentially cost-free, hopefully, or very little cost. Um, for example, I do have some thoughts about communication, but for today I want to talk about one issue that's bothered me for six years, which is about outdoor time for kids. And I, you know, obviously I have young kids, so my issues are about younger kids. Um, my daughter, when she was in kindergarten, she was given two recesses, and teachers have observed and studies have shown that the children were better be able to behave um, and learn with breaks that allowed them to move and get their jiggles out. But about five years ago, the second break was taken away, and now we've even extended the school day for 15 minutes. Um, my, kinder my kindergartner comes home incredibly high-strung and tired. 
I can only imagine how stressed the teachers must be trying to keep 20 plus kids sitting still in a class with only one outdoor break from 8.30 to 3.30 actually now. Um, so I'm hoping that given our limited resources, the high stress level of teachers and the mental health concerns for kids, that we can look for solutions that are inexpensive and doable, such as either adding more recess time or providing teachers with the flexibility to add outdoor breaks to the younger kids' schedules so that they, because they need it. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. My name is Manny. I guess I'm the, the um, newest member to, to the uh, Central Area Advisory Council, and I appreciate Let me be a part of this. Uh, so I'm a transplant from Philadelphia, so if you hear my if some things come out of my accent, I apologize. <laughs> That's how I speak. It's not anything wrong. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say thank, thank you to the entire board and everyone in BCPS for everything you had to go through in the last year. You put in extra hours. You, you were doing some things that probably weren't weren't really compensated. And uh, as a as a child of a civil servant, my grandfather was a Philadelphia police detective. My my mother was a SEPTA bus driver in Philly. Um, I understand sometimes it could be a thankless job. And so I know that's important to, to see that there's some appreciation there. So I want to say there's there's a couple things we need to improve on. I think is, is mainly is communication. I know I've seen a lot of people vent online through about uh, individualized education plans. Uh, special education has been an issue, and, and we understand that with the with the COVID crisis. But that's something that I think should be um, should be improved upon. And some good things too. I think there's been a lot more clarity around technology. I don't. I think I had like a technology problem with with my daughter's laptop probably once every other week when we're in the height of the pandemic. And now I really don't even hear anything about her complaining. So that's that's a good sign. The other part of it is, is health and safety, you know, with uh, piping, you have lead issues. I think that should be a priority in the next uh, capital budgeting uh, process. So I'm not sure what the timeline is on that, but I see kids with water bottles every single day. It's kind of surprising. I didn't know that that was a, a big problem. It's not just one school, but I think that's something that needs to be looked at. The other part of this is, is um, equity when it comes to dietary needs. My daughter is vegetarian. There's some people for religious reasons who do not meet, eat meat. Uh, yesterday she had a cheese its and a uh, cheese stick, and that was that was her choice, her option uh, available. Uh, so I think I think for for that standpoint, I think that's some, something that could be approved on. And I end with this. I, I look at the kind of the financial things, the tea leaves and that sort of thing. Real estate prices are about seven and a half percent for Baltimore County which is awesome, uh, but I hope that the board is recognizing that trees don't grow to the sky. When, it looks, when you look at budget deficits, you hear people giving recommendations, and you also hear people who are developing, developing in a community that you strike a balance between equity and, and the deals that are being made for the county and the kids. Because it, what it comes down to is, this is the dollars, right? The tax dollars, and yes, there's, there's always some jobs that we can add and that sort of thing, but we're in a really good, strong jobs market. Maybe we look at the long term, five, ten years, and we don't give necessarily a, a, a free free pass at uh, paying their right share of, of the taxes. And uh, that's it. That's it for me. Good evening to all. I really want to thank uh, the board and thank Ms. Sibley for arranging this this meeting. It's a good communication. Uh, um, both ways. Um, from my end, I think, I think my active member has already made many points, so I like to focus on giving you an overall picture of the central area rather than talk to you about certain issues such as transportation and others. Um, I have been the chair now for a year uh, when we started a year ago, we started slow, but for sure. And initially it was so slow that our attendance of our meetings, um, you know, presentations have been really limited. Uh, however, being persistent and thinking outside the box has really yielded quite a bit fruit, which I really like to share with you. Uh, so before I became a chair, I want you to know I was a member for three years. And really the, the central area had very little activities at that time. I really wondered as a member uh, whether it's really worth it 
to be a member because I didn't really do anything. Uh, when I became a member, our first, second meeting, we really hardly seen any attendance of parents, uh, let alone teachers. Uh, however, as we persisted as a team collectively in organizing quality meetings where the, the topic is timely and the speakers are good quality speakers, we have seen a rise in the attendance all the way through the last two months, which has been the best. So I'll just give you an example. We had the budget meeting last year in October, and really nobody from the community came. Um, it was basically us. Our last two meetings, the one about mental illness, uh, the membership, the attendance was more than 30. The one of last month was about student discipline. Not only we had more than 30, uh, people on, on the Zoom counter, but we had parents that came in and participated, which is really something I have not really seen last year. So as a parameter, you know, for trying to be the bridge between the Board of Education and the community in the central area, I personally see that progress and I won't really to make sure I transmit to you as our board, because we really work for you, and uh, we work with you and we work for you. Um, the other uh, presentation I would like to make to you, as a chair, honestly, I did not really know what it involves to be a chair, all right? Thank you, Donna, thank you, Ingrid. It's really time consuming, all right? And it is rewarding in a sense when we see the results. But without the active members in the central area, none of the past, I don't know, seven or eight presentations that we have made since last year, since August, September of last year until now, would have been really a reality, all right? And all of us, we are truly focused on doing one thing and one thing only, what is the best for the students? And as a chair, I have always really focused on, on that myself and encouraged my team. So I just want to plug for the team. As you can see, we have four of them here uh, with me number five. Two others have not really been able to come in because of uh, work situation and uh, babysitting and they will send you their notes by email to make sure that you hear their voices and you know that they are active. The one and only that did not really participate had some issues and, um, you know, is excused. Um, last two points I want to add to what Ingrid and Yuri said, and both are really important. When I immigrated to Baltimore, from Texas, no, not from Texas. Uh, when I immigrated to Baltimore, I heard that phrase, melting pot, a lot, okay? And Madam Chair, I hope you stop me if I take too long, but I, I think you might like what I say. Um, what I really remember is the immigration judge who sworn me in told all of us we were like a thousand of all colors and shapes. Do not forget your culture. Do not forget where you came from. So although we all strive to be the melting pot that Ingrid talked about, we are actually a nation of salad. And maybe some of us would like to mix that salad in a blender and make a fruit, vegetable juice out of it. Uh, but there are people who would not really want to be that way. Either way, I think the mission of the school system needs to be to address not only Asian Americans, not only African Americans, not only Muslims like myself, not just Arab Americans, not just Indian Americans, not just the Eskimos and the, the other categories, needs to address all of them and the curriculum needs to be factual 
as far as history. It cannot really be a curriculum that is designed to portray the European as much as I love Europe, all right? Um, the European way of reflecting what history is. It needs to be fair. It needs to be factual. And the idea that Ingrid really has mentioned, I believe in it. If we understand other nations, not only we understand us, but we potentially could save us from doing unnecessary wars that will cost money, which will be taken away from our schools and cause people to die and come back with PTSD and so forth. So, you know, if I can say anything about the curriculum, I, I, I really believe that, you know, we should leave no child behind. You know, Dr. Hirston used to talk about that in a different kind of context. You know, we should really address all minorities in a fair and accurate way. And, and I think that will go a long, long way. Um, so I know I talk too much. Um, I'm, I'm really proud of the team that you see and very proud of the three people that could not really come in. And I want to make sure that they are represented. And thank you all. Thank you. Now it is a time for everyone, not at one time though, to ask any questions or make comments or have anyone explain anything. And I'm gonna start with the board. If you have any questions for any of the advisory councils, now's your chance. Scott. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody can hear me. Uh, we need a microphone. <laughs> Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Um, my question is, as far as you all had, I think almost each of you, all of you said something in regards to communications. So my question is, what do you mean when you say communications? Are you saying communications from the board to you all or the board to the community? Or um, I just wanted to see if someone could expand upon that. Um, because several people said communications. Thank you. Um, I'll also give other people if they want to speak on this. When we've spoken about communication in the Northeast, it actually is more about the two-way communication. The, the advisory councils are supposed to be this liaison between the community and the board. We provide input for the budget, et cetera. So, I think sometimes there's a little bit of frustration because sometimes at these budget meetings, it's the same thing we're presenting time and time again. And for me, I'll speak it just like as a parent, even if the response is no or later, I think it's helpful when you have a response. And so sometimes like we've even done these where we're bringing all of these concerns to the board. Jackie just, I think had like 10 to 15 questions. And it's like, even if there's some way to have an official response of, you know, yes, we're going to be addressing Dundalk, or um, it's just helpful because, you know, even for us, as we're here and we get frustrated a little bit, so I'm sure our community members also get frustrated. But just the idea of having some type of response, either it's a yes, no, maybe we're looking at it, it's better than kind of silence. Response from the board. Um, because that's who we're communicating with when we when we relay these issues. I don't know if there's restrictions on that. I see Julie, you're getting ready to speak. But even if, um, so I don't know. I don't know now if we have to address policy or something about that, but. It needs to go to somebody else. They need to tell us to pass, who do we need to pass it to? I was just saying, if, if it needs, the issue needs to go to someone else with another department, who do we need to pass that to? Like her questions that she had. Okay, so. The first question, who does that go to? Does it go to a certain department? Like you said, is it policy? So. Sure, so. Tiffany, I'd like to yeah. respond. Oh, go ahead. I'd like to respond um, to that if I may. And thank you for that question, Ms. Scott. Um, 
the, I heard you say the first thing is you'd like a response on behalf of the board. Um, part of the challenge in that is that, and the chair is the spokesperson for the board, unless the board has taken a position on something and we voted in public, we cannot, I do not speak, the chair does not speak for the board in, in that our position is X unless the board has taken a position. So I hear your frustration in saying we want a yes, no, something. We cannot say that. I cannot say that. No one can say the board has taken a position if we haven't taken a position. And the way we take a position is when we vote on something in public, that's when you know what our position is. And it's after the fact. So to that sense, that that is something we can't do and, and wouldn't want to do because I don't speak for the other 11 or 10, 10 people on the board. Um, where you will hear your feedback echoed, or I would hope you would hear that, is when we discuss and deliberate in open session when these issues come up. And I'll give you an example. In the Northeast, I sound like a broken record on transportation. You could ask any staff member um, at any time since I've been on the board um, what my number one issue that I've raised most often has been, and it's been transportation because I know the issues that the Northeast has been plagued with this time. The number of students on the bus, the safety issues that you've mentioned are near and dear to my heart, and from my, not only from my time, but to, you know, to hear your feedback, hey, this is persistent. You should be hearing us relay your concerns when we're deliberating. And it may not be take the form of a formal response, but you should be hearing that. You should be hearing that from your board representative who's elected. You should be hearing it from the at-large members. You should be hearing it from in our discussions. And I would expect you, you to hear them because nothing that was raised tonight, and I have a page of notes, I, have, I write really tiny, but I think I've captured everything that, that was written. And should be, you should hear that echoed. You should hear your thoughts expressed in some way, shape, or fashion. And if you check the agendas when something is coming up and say, hey, remember when I raised this at that advisory meeting with the board? Don't forget, this is important to, to us. Or in your um, testimony, you know, because you have stakeholder time at every meeting just to, to put that extra bug in our ears and say, remember this when you deliberate on that and send us data or if a policy is coming up for review, this is important. So your feedback, that's how you'll hear what we've done with the input that we've been given, even if you don't get a formal response back, like this is the board's position on that. And I hope that helps. And sure. I'd also like to just uh, echo what you've said. Also, there were, I believe it goes back probably five or six years ago, former uh, superintendents did meet after when we have our budget meetings in October, we would send a list, and it usually was the first, either the end of November or the first part of December. And we don't, we're not asking to say, yes, we're gonna do this, yes, we're gonna do that. That's not, we just want to make sure that when the stakeholders come, that they know we have brought it to the attention of the board and the administration. And it really did help because there were times when they, nope, this isn't gonna happen because we don't have the funds, we don't have the ability to do that. But yes, we didn't think about this, we will try to consider that. And I think that's the other thing we're, we're asking. The other, I believe, is the communication within the schools. And I know Tracy does her hardest to get the flyers out to the schools. I just want to mention to also to the chairs, it's really important that you get those out. If possible, you should get it out almost a month before the meeting because different schools I found. Actually, when I was, when I was first chair, I drove the, the flyers around to every school in the central area. That's a lot of schools. It's a good thing the gas was not as expensive then as it is now. And then I have friends in these schools and they say, we never got a flyer. And I thought, I made hundreds of those flyers and I took them. <laughs> so I know the principals try, but if they put their newsletter out and you've missed that time, 
that so you if you can get an idea of when those principals send those new le newsletters out and make sure you get it to Tracy so she can get it to the schools on time. And I'll add one quick thing to that. The other thing when this goes back a few years um, at Chapel Hill when I was on the PTA there one of the things we did was formed a community awareness committee within the PTA and that um, promoted the Northeast Advisory through that committee, and it it added um, just a mechanism to you know flag, hey, let's get an update. So every time that PTA published the committee updates, the um, Northeast Advisory um, updates, schedules, meetings were included in the PTA's update. So if there's any way you can tag along with a group that's already doing it and kind of double dip, that was something that we did to help communication um, just another idea because that was a challenge it's it's always a challenge right getting in front of families their attention is divided in a million different directions but one of the things in the northeast that we also do tracy's great i'm not i don't get it to her month ahead and but even if I don't, she'll tag me if I haven't sent something to her. So um, kudos to you. I always say she reminds me. Thank you. Um, but we also use Facebook with the social media. So most of the schools have um, PTA Facebook pages. So that's something else that we do. Like I'll send a note with the flyer to those pages. I'm members of the pages, and then I'll send that so um, that's another way we in the Northeast try to get in front of in front of the parents because like you said the PTA is important and then another piece of what we did um, this year with our meetings in February we as the members went out to the schools to the PTA meetings because sometimes you know what you find so virtual is great but still sometimes what you find is that people have these activities in the evening and it, it just doesn't work with the times so if you can go to where they are hear their voices, hear what the concerns are, then we know we're accurately capturing that information as well. So that, That's great. You know, any sites that you can use that already have followings, you can grow your following by um, doing that. Also, your area's elected officials are always looking for things to include in their newsletters and on their social media pages, and they are happy to promote your events as well to their followers so again if you you can tag team on on their information too they're happy to promote your activities i also wanted to say that i almost forgot to say this and i had thought about it earlier um we really should be using face more family and community engagement suhan if you send her your you know your schedule of your uh, meetings there's a representative almost every school that she has. And um, Sue and I worked together for a long time, and I know Sue is very, very, um, she's, she's really wants to get parents involved. So please think about using that. I just thought I'd point out something from decades ago before there was internet, and I find it ironic that um, when I was in high school, we actually knew um, at the beginning of the school year, all of the meetings every month of the advisory council, where they were going to be. And we had 15 people plus a student representative on, on the advisory councils. I mean, there was great competition actually to even get on the advisory council. So I think it's kind of ironic now that we have the internet that we're not getting the communications or the uh, um, participation that before when we didn't have internet, how come people were vying to get on the advisory councils and how we could set the schedule a year in advance, like literally over the summer, it's set, you know exactly what month, what school you're, you're going to have the meeting. And um, I, I knew I, this is before there was a student member on the board actually. So I, as a student, um, I would be communicating with um, whoever necessary, whether it was the PTA of Baltimore County, uh, whether it was Baltimore County School um, Councils. Um, so uh, in, in Al Naney was constantly actually at Towson High. You're talking to David King. So uh, even if the superintendent is only one person, right? Bob DeBell was very busy. So, but the assistant um, uh, superintendents were 
were there to also help communicate. And I remember communicating with Carolyn Boytnot, who was on the board at the time. So um, it, as a student, I remember calling, literally calling um, the 20 some other high schools just to make sure we had communications. Um, so if we can tap into whoever is on the advisory councils and, and we do teamwork, okay, um, that, uh, I would think that, you know, with internet, we should be able to do better than when we didn't have internet. So communications is definitely teamwork and uh, just encourage and encourage uh, parents, encourage grandparents. I mean, it's just when you meet people, just, just I mean, that's how I kind of recruited more people to central area. I kind of think of, you know, how do we diversify? How do we tap into all different um, sectors of our community? Um, kind of think, think networking. I mean, networking is so important and, and it should be easier now with the internet. Um, that we can kind of get each other, get viewpoints from, you know, locally and far and wide. Um, and, and I know people who travel. So even if they're not here now with uh, remote options, I know when we traveled over the summer before there was the pandemic, I mean, I offered to help by email, even if I could be in person. So, so I think we, it's important to, to allow all options, shall we say, and kind of tap into all different possibilities. I think I, if I can go back to what Jackie's concern was with the communication is that we spend a lot of time meeting with our stakeholders. We spend a lot of time bringing those topics to you. You're telling us that you, you can't discuss them and say something unless you're in a group. Then how do our topics get on your agenda? What, what issues make it to your agenda? Because I think that's the question. Like if we're, if we're bringing these topics to you and you know, then we're not seeing them on your agenda so that you're discussing them as a board and getting a position, then how do our topics get on your agenda? Sure, would you like me to take that? Sure, I, I can address that. Um, so before every meeting, um, Dr. Williams and the board officers meet to plan the agenda for the upcoming meeting. Um, so we take feedback from other board members at the end of every meeting, we or every other meeting I should say, we have um, a round table where we go around and board members make requests for agenda items to be added. They're providing items that they've heard from their constituents, their stakeholders. If they're coming out to your meetings, they're, they're funneling those back to us. Um, we're contributing items and we have a running list of what those items are. Some are shared in the full board meeting, others go to committees. So you'll hear a lot of the items that come up raised in committees and that's where that work happens. So if, if you're not paying attention to the committee meetings, a lot of work is happening in those committees. Um, so don't think that the work stops in the full board meeting because a lot of it's happening there. Um, and also if there's something very timely, those will usually pop up on our radar as well and we'll try to add those Try not to add anything at the last minute, but we'll try to get those on the agenda if there's a time sensitive issue. Um, you know, around COVID, for instance, and the reopening of schools, that was one that was added quite regularly, um, not as a, almost as a standing agenda item there for a while because there were so many concerns and rightly so the community had concerns and we want, the board wanted to discuss it um, on a regular basis. So to, I hope that, that answers your question in that meeting we, we try to um, add anything that's time sensitive, certainly, and then funnel those requests up when we plan our agendas for the meetings. So if those topics make it to a committee, then why, why can't you tell us that it's, it's this, you, you know, we've sent this topic five times. This topic made it to a committee so that you know, we know that it's being discussed and it's in a committee meeting. Sure, so those agendas are published just like our full board meeting agendas are published. Um, ahead of time, we publish those. Um, Ms. Gover and the staff liaisons, we, there's a staff liaison for each committee um, who publishes that agenda ahead of time before. The committee meetings are live streamed. All of our committees meet virtually now. Um, so we've seen greater participation in those as well as it's been easier for board mem members to participate is the feedback I've gotten as well. And the, the minutes are also published for those. And they're searchable on board docs. If there's a particular topic you're interested, you can search by keyword to see if it's on an agenda or when the last time it was discussed. Policies are scheduled to come up for review if it's a particular policy issue um, every five years, if not more frequently. And you can see when those are scheduled to be discussed too. 
or contact your board member. If there's someone you've had a conversation with and say, hey, is this scheduled to, to come up anytime soon? And we can check on that too. I think we need a mic over here, Ms. Causey and Ms. Mack would like to. Oh, now we're down to one mic. <laughs> I just want to speak to the comments made by um, the central area, Ingrid specifically, and I apologize because I don't know your last name. Okay. Um, I was a student who benefited from, I went to Southern High School, which no longer exists, and somehow or another, we, were, we had the opportunity to go abroad in the 11th grade, which was unheard of back in the 70s, and we went to Belgium, England and France, um, which then resulted in me becoming an adult and for three years having a French exchange student, so who is now 45 with four kids, um, and she is my friend. And it, it was just a wonderful experience that enhanced my life. And then I'm sorry I don't know the gentleman's name who talked about history. Anybody who knows me knows I read a lot and I love history. But because I'm on curriculum and instruction, I've begun to look at history differently. And I just saw a PBS show about Custer's last stand. And I remember being taught that Custer and his men were massacred. But when I watched the Ken Burns special, goes into why they were massacred, and it was a whole different slant. And then I think about people that I never learned about in school. I never, I went to middle school or junior high school, if not in Curtis Bay, but I never heard of Henrietta Lacks until it became the book of the semester at CCBC. I've been a volunteer at Johns Hopkins. I never heard about her until that book. And I'll test all of you. Does anybody here know who Vivian Thomas is? Yes. So Dr. Blaylock was working on a procedure to save children who up until that period of time died because they didn't have adequate blood flow. Vivian Thomas was a lab supervisor who worked side by side with him and got very little credit for that procedure because he was a black man. I didn't know about Katherine Johnson until the, figure, the Hidden Figures movie came out, um, but I just read a book does anybody know who Rosalind Franklin is? Rosalind Franklin actually was the first person to take a picture of the double helix, but because she was a woman, they didn't want her to get credit for it, and Watson and Crick stole her work and presented it as their own. So all of that to say, I agree with you. I think we can do a much better job talking about all people, all contributions, and I hope to see that happen. So thank you for bringing that up, because history is so important to me, and also other cultures. I, it was the highlight of my life at a very young age, so thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Good evening, everybody. Um, the first thing, I just want to say thank you to everyone that is on the advisory councils, that's chair of the councils, that's coordinator of the councils. Um, with, in my work on the board over the last uh, six years or so, um, I've really benefited from everyone that's been engaged with the advisory councils. So um, although I don't get to all the meetings, um, the Southeast, read the minutes in the, in the board docs, you know, and listen to everyone when they come to speak to us and read your emails and so forth. Um, I agree that there needs to be improved communications in, in all directions, um, and that is something that Dr. Williams and the board has been working on. Uh, one of the issues that I see uh, as a barrier is the board has one staff member in Ms. Tracy Gover, who, as we all know, works very hard, and I appreciate your, um, your appreciation of her. Um, but the board, just this budget cycle, asked for an ombudsman in order to understand, um, engage with parents, and understand concerns and provide a feedback loop. 
and that was not funded by the county executive. So uh, I see that as concern. Uh, but there are other ways that we can um, try and improve that. And <clears throat> one of the things that I was thinking about, because um, Ms. Hen rightly is pointing out that there's a lot of resources that are on the website. Um, so Board Docs has every meeting, it has the agenda, it has the documents that are prepared from Dr. Williams and his team, and it has the minutes that have the votes. So there are the decisions that are made and you can see who voted which way. Um, what is less obvious uh, sometimes is why people may have made certain votes. Um, the transcript is available, so you can do a word search of the transcripts of each meeting, um, you know, or watch them, or as Ms. Hen said, call the uh, board members, because there's overlapping in the council with the seven members, or an appointed member, and say what, you know, I see you voted this way, why was that? Or can you fill me in on this? Um, the other thing I'll say, and there is more work that's being done uh, around that is improving the website. So related to facilities, um, there, Anne Arundel County and um, Howard County, they have uh, really robust um, facilities, construction improvement uh, websites where you can look and see, you know, here's a picture of the job site, here's the in-depth. Um, we also have an EFMP, which is I think 500 pages, the Education Facility Master Plan, and that's public, and that goes into incredible detail about about what the plans are. Um, but I do believe there needs to be more. And the other thing that would just started recently, um, Dr. Williams had um, someone on his staff do the, you know, things to know about the board meeting. So it's a, it's a brief thing that goes out as a news alert. But an idea I had is um, we get, as employees and board members, it's called Communications Media Daily. And someone gets up in the morning or stays up late at night and they compile links about education related media stories and it comes out in one email and so you'll scroll through and if something's interesting you click in and see more. Um, perhaps we could consider and Tracy maybe you can have see if someone in Dr. Williams team can do this is do a, a monthly you know communication media or communication for the advisories. Here's the committees that are coming up. Here's what happened in the committees and the minutes, where it's all kind of linked together, so you don't have to go 18 places. Um, but you know, depending on what the concerns are, um, you could click in and see that. So there, there are lots of ways that we can improve. And I, Ingrid, thank you so much um, for all of your comments. I appreciate all your comments. I also will dovetail about um, improving the history presentation and and getting a lot um, more richness. And there is a lot of richness, but as we know, we can improve. Um, <clears throat> uh, but your point, um, Ms. Ingrid, was we should be able to do better with the internet. So I think it's a matter of connecting the dots and also someone mentioned assistant superintendents. So there has been realignment with assistant superintendents, community superintendents, and now we are two executive directors under. Um, so I think there needs to be a realignment of board members and a staff member that's more closely tied as a liaison that's kind of a, a communication link. Um, so as we are adjusting, those are things that we, we can consider. Um, and I had also the comment about recess, I gotta get this in. February 2019, the board voted um, to increase the student day 15 minutes, and we voted to have that, those 15 minutes in elementary school go to recess. We didn't get funding for a couple years, and then when we got funding, it was post-pandemic and decision was made to um, spend 15 minutes in math. So that is something, though, that I think is very important, and I think what we've found, and someone made the comment about coming back to school as pre-pandemic, when we know that students are different, everyone's been impacted, um, so we, maybe we need to look differently at what the schedule is gonna be next year in terms of um, including things that are overall more healthy for students and teachers, because if the kids are out playing, then the teachers might get a breath of fresh air and <laughs> a planning period. So anyway, I've talked too much. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Manny.
just like okay, thank you thank you yeah i i think uh, everyone had a lot of ideas I, I really am a big advocate of technology and so one idea that kind of just popped in my head while we we're all talking is is maybe having a chat bot and you can program now just crazy uh that that bot reads all the data on the website and a, and a parent could just click in a question like we all have right now when you go to your your cable website or your you know our different website you can just put in a question in a natural language they can respond back to you and I think that's one other thing that you can do and then social media is a really big thing you got to be where people are and so with the pandemic that's where the parents are and so uh, I follow Dr. Williams on, on Twitter and I you know look at you know, different things, follows BCPS on Facebook. Uh, but I think maybe if you have like a bigger emphasis on getting that word out, maybe just being um, being more aware of, you know, just trying to drum up opportunities for people to, to follow that page and ask them to follow that page. I think that's where communications could be a little bit more improved. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, Manny, I. I love that idea, Manny. Thanks for sharing that for the, the chat bot, bot. I think that's fantastic. And I was just going to add that the learning curve of, of BCPS in the world is huge. I've been on the board five and a half years and the Northeast Advisory for a few years before that. And I'm, I'm still floored at how much I, I don't know and how much I'm learning each and every day about um, there's a show called How, how It Works or How Things Work. Is anybody a fan of that? OK. My family loves that show. I've got three engineers at home. Um, okay, so you you know the show. They they summarize how you know something miraculous is done in a half hour episode. I feel like if we did that for BCPS, it would be three years of of explaining what how things work. We we are a complex, large, multifaceted um, school system, and with a lot of people that have very complex roles. And understanding that takes time. Um, one thing that was very helpful to me, we talk about board members attending meetings. Mrs. Causey came out um, to the Northeast Advisory and one of our former board members, and I'll never forget it. And that, I credit her and this other member for why I'm on the board today, because she came out to our advisory meeting and was a guide by my side to help me get acclimated. And um, what I wanted to offer you all, I, I put, put together kind of a ori little orientation packet to one of our newest board members. Um, I am thinking I'll work with Ms. Gover on seeing what we can do to make that more appropriate for the advisories or you know, making sure it's external facing um, and can be repurposed for the new board that's coming on in, in 22, those new members. But maybe that might be a, a starting point in terms of resources and you know, explaining how things are made and from that perspective, and, and I share that perspective as a former advisory member of what might be helpful and getting started, what I wish I knew then that, that might be helpful for, for you all. And also just, again, having somebody by your side could be helpful. So if in your meeting cat schedule for the year, if you would like to include a, a board member introduction, orientation, Sounds like I'll be returning, so I'm personally volunteering to come out to your meetings. If you would like to um, invite me, I would be honored to come out and give an orientation to new members or current members. Feel free to invite me to one. I'd be honored and happy to do that. I want to second what Ms. Causey said about the calendar. 15 years ago, I suggested a rolling calendar on the BCPS website to list every meeting that we had because there were some really good meetings, three or four in the same night, and each would have two or three people. So I second that, so I'm hoping that maybe we can move on that. Are there any really important questions? We're nearing our time. One more, Dr. Farone. I know it's getting seconds. late, but I have a question for you as a board and administration. Um, we are not in pandemic, but who knows in September, October, if the virus came back or its cousin or mutation, is the school system ready? And number two, there is more danger of recession in the U.S. today than a month ago. And there are more risks for us as a nation from outside. That will affect funding. 
So my question to you, Dr. Williams, and to the board, is the school system ready facing any of those scenarios um, in September so we don't wind up um, like with the COVID, we got caught by surprise and students lost a year at home. So good evening again, everyone. Um, Dr. Farona, I appreciate you asking that question. We've learned a lot from the last two years about how to manage during the pandemic, even how to manage during the cyber attack. My wish is that we don't have to manage either one ever again, but based on our partners, I will always say this, no one on this board is a physician, Therefore, we rely on our health department, and we were working with Johns Hopkins University and University of Maryland physicians to guide us in the, in the appropriate way of managing during the pandemic. Um, so, um, and Dr. Zarchin can also weigh in, but it is our hope that we are prepared. Notice what happened when we came back from winter break. We had to pivot for some schools, not all schools, so that was a learning curve for many of our communities where some students were able to come back and some we had to just shut down for a break a week or two. Um, and so I think across the state, we have uh, dealt with this and prepared. Uh, we are still working with our health experts. We're still watching um, the numbers. We're still getting the advice and we, and we do follow the CDC guidelines. So. Um, it is my prayer, so I'm going to take a page out of your book. It is my prayer that we don't have to relive um, what we did for the last year. Um, but I'm proud about the work that our, our staff, students, and parents did because that brought us closer. Folks wanted to fight us, but they realized join the group, work together as a group to bring about change. So that's, that's just where we are at, at, at this point. So um, I will also say we still push for vaccines. Um, there was just a report, I believe yesterday, about the low number of uh, students across the state that got their vaccines. I think our state superintendent uh, reported on that. So uh, that's all I have for you at this point. Okay. Say that BCP has really did a good job about uh, reopening the school and since uh, September, something around that time. I think uh, mentally it was very helpful for the kids to go back to school. With the masks on in the beginning, I personally think it's very safe to my, uh, my personal opinion at that time because we all get the vaccines, got the booster. So because we had uh, some numbers about the suicidal, this kind of thing. So I think it's very helpful for the kids go, going back to school around uh, September. So I think it's a lesson we learned, and it's a very good trend that we try to stay open if we can with uh, advice from the health communities. So I just want to say uh, BCP has done really did a good job. And uh, even if the cousins, like uh, Dr. the cousins of the virus come back again, I think, I think we already have that experience. Try to keep the schools open and the masks on something. And, yep, I personally think it's okay, but, but if the uh, John Hopkins, they have another say something, I think you guys know how to, how to take the full adv advantage of that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank everyone for coming. If there's no other business, Meetings adjourned. Thank you.